everybody. Uh, I'm Tim Mayer. I'm from uh, NASA Servier from the Science Coordination Office. Um, I wanted to pass it over to Emil to also introduce himself as he's getting a photo for Twitter. Hey, everybody. Uh, Emil Charrington, also with the Servier Science Coordination Office. And I'm Biplo Bandari, also with the Servier Science Coordination Office. So we, want, we have a session today focusing on capacity building, which is sort of the bread and butter of, of NASA Servier. So if you're in this room, this is kind of a spicy, semi-spicy session. There's going to be a long, hands-on demo. So to do that, feel free to click on the slides and just open the slides. We're going to then just jump into the slides and then, then into the collab. So we'll have a little bit of time to talk about Servier and what we do and why we do it. Uh, but then we'll just get right into some of the demos as well. So um, drink your coffee and make sure you start getting into the code as well. So um, feel free to just click on this link and we'll take you to the slides. So the first thing on housekeeping here, um, does everyone have a Google Cloud project? Hopefully you should. If you don't or if you're confused about anything I just said, uh, feel free to raise your hand. Um, you can create one right now. They're very simple to create. If you can't create one because of your org or your institution, uh, Nick in the back can help set up a temporary one. Um, but then that'll eventually be dissolved at the end of the week as well. So we're going to be using a collab here um, to save some of the images. Um, and having that cloud project is really important. And it can set you up for the future um, using, using Google Earth Engine. Um, the very, big, very beginning of our talk here, I wanted to just call up the attention to the vast number of folks who are involved with the development of this particular tool we'll be talking about. Um, so you know we're focused. Um, as part of the applied sciences, a part of the capacity building program on you know, developing skills, not only at the institutional level, but at the individual level. And we could have talked about uh, many, many different sets of services that we, we work on, but we're picking just the hydroflood system. So that's going to be our demo today. But you can see there's a vast number of folks who have helped develop this over the past four years. And many of the folks are actually from uh, Southeast Asia, and are unable to attend because it's like 3 o'clock in the morning. Um, so we've got a couple people actually patching in live from our, our uh, science coordination office and around the globe right now. Uh, so if you've got any questions that are about the particular tool, we can also patch them in as well. Uh, so I just wanted to pray, uh, pay some credit to those folks. Um, so because we do a lot of capacity building, uh, and that's sort of the main way in which we talk about bringing Earth observations to individuals and into institutions to help improve their decision making. We do these types of trainings all around the world. And generally, this training that we're about to give is about two full days. So we're going to condense it into about 30 minutes. So that's hence the spiciness. Um, and in really important for capacity building, we always like to do surveys. So we're going to give you kind of the flavor of how we do these training of trainers, where we want you to you know, tell us your skills at the very beginning, and then we'll do the training, and then you're going to tell us what you learned. Um, and that's really important if you think about it over the long term for years, how we could be improving you know, how, how folks in an institution um, grow their skills, and also that institution by and large. So feel free. Please just fill out this survey at the very beginning. Um, we'll see how you guys did. And then I just wanted to lay out sort of what our plan is for today. You know, sort of our goals are to talk about Severe, to talk about capacity building and the way in which we capacity build, um, and then also allow folks to kind of cut their teeth on one of these services. So that's sort of our main goal. Uh, we only have about 45, 55 minutes, so we're going to go really fast. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, Severe while you guys are getting your code up and running. We're going to talk about hydro floods, the algorithm itself, how it's used. Um, we're also going to do that hand, hands-on demo. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about examples and use cases, the operational use of hydro floods, uh, and then we're going to talk about conclusions. We'll have some time for people to ask some questions and then do that post-survey. So uh, hopefully we'll get it in the 60, 60 minutes. If not, these slides are there in perpetuity. And also there's a lot of bonuses we've hidden in the collab for you, you know, to, to explore uh, a lot of goodies. So I'll hand it over to Emil. Yeah, thank you so much, Tim. And of course, uh, as Tim said, also thank you to our other colleagues from the Science Coordination Office who've contributed to this. And I guess maybe the one big thing to mention about Severe, Severe is a joint partnership of NASA and the US Agency for International Development. And the main focus of Severe is applying Earth observation data to different uh, types of development challenges. And here at Geo for Good, you've heard about people you know, applying uh, 
geospatial technologies to, to different uh, challenges, and that's also you know one of the focuses of uh, of our work in Severe. We focus mainly on. Um, I guess, well, before I jump to that, just to also say that uh, with our program uh, and the support, again, of, of USAID, we're focused uh, currently in five regions of the world, uh, South America, um, Western and Eastern and Southern Africa, the Hindu Kush Himalaya um, region of Asia, and the Mekong. Um, we also, uh, through Severe, uh, have a solicitation where we connect with uh, researchers from different um, you know, universities, mainly in research centers uh, here in the U.S. Um, we actually have uh, Shijuan Chen, who's standing over there, if you want to wave Shijuan. Um, <laughs> and Ahmed as well, <laughs> another partner that we work with. We have you know, different, different folks you know, connected at different labs. For instance, we have a, a current project with Boston University that's been applying uh, CCDC and other data sets, kind of like you would have heard if you were in the room here you know, 20 minutes ago, et cetera. And so just to say that Severe is kind of leveraging you know, science developed by different research centers here in the U.S. and applying that to, again, the regions that we're working in. And in terms of who we are and kind of you know, why Severe here at Google, uh, Geo for Good, uh, Google is you know, one of our you know, strong private sector uh, collaborators as well as um, other entities you know, in the private sector that we work with, uh, including Planet, Esri, Amazon, Maxar, et cetera. And just to say again that what we have is, you know, we like to think of it as a big severe family, but it's also a severe network of different entities that we're working with, uh, including, you know, different parts of the U.S. government. Uh, shout out to um, Chelsea from USGS and Silver Carbon in the back also waving. <laughs> so thank you so much. Um, and then just to say, too, that we have a, an overall approach. And so Tim was talking about the survey. Uh, and one thing that we're doing is uh, we have something called the service planning um, approach where we you know, address, we, we try to develop capacity doing, um, doing that through uh, different phases, or, but rather having a kind of comprehensive look at how we can um, develop capacity. Um, and then I think this is practically my last slide, just to say, too, that the work that we do, we do it in um, four main thematic areas, agriculture and food security, uh, water and related disasters, and that's really related to why, you know, y'all are in the room right now, um, land cover, land use, uh, change in ecosystems, and weather and climate. As Tim said, we work across these four different um, areas, but for, for today's session, we're going to be focusing on the water area. And so with that, turn it back over to Tim. Thank you. So now we're going to get into that collab. So hopefully you can get into it. I'll, I'm looking, I'm sort of putting on my educator hat here and looking into everyone's eyes <laughs> in case you've actually gotten in, and hopefully you have. So I'll be uh, sort of running it simultaneously, um, and Biplov's going to be up here, and we're going to be get, jumping between the slides and the notebook a little bit to talk about the algorithm and the package itself. Yeah. Perfect. And Emil and Nick are running around if you have any questions. So let's open up this notebook. So the first thing, I, I just kind of want to take a quick survey around the room. Who here has used a CoLab notebook before? A couple of hands. A big hand over there. <laughs> He's like, yes, <laughs> I, I love CoLab. And some people, if you haven't, that's OK. We kind of wanted to build this session as like, we know Geo for Good is really great about connecting folks who maybe have you know, more focus in Google Earth and maybe are just now getting to Earth Engine and now maybe that next step is using Python in CoLab. So we wanted to talk about the integration a little bit and make it kind of a stepping stone. So the first thing, if you haven't used CoLab before, just go ahead and copy our notebook because you want to be saving this notebook in your own drive for the future. So go ahead and just uh, copy that drive. Save a copy to your drive, I should say. Uh, the slides, so the slides, if you just go to geo for good right in our session right here, uh, you can just open up this link and it'll take you right to the slides. So if you don't have that, I'm just pause here. So I know many folks, when you get a Jupyter notebook like this, you just like run every single cell. I mean, I'm guilty of that. So I've put some graphics in here to maybe slow folks down and kind of think about some of the steps. And there's some, some stumbling blocks that we put some graphics in here to help you sort of walk through. So that way you have like more comfortability using CoLab in the future. Um, and then you can maybe explore the, the HydroFlood system itself. So we're just gonna set this up. Um, and I will just show you uh, very quickly on the slides here we tried to synthesize sort of the, the, some of the stumbling blocks that you might run into in the collab. So 
I'll be showing the slides and feel free to just click through. The first thing that you're going to want to run is go ahead and do this pip install for the HydroFloods GEE, the HydroFloods package and the GEE map. And we have built this, and I should really say, Kel, who's running the simultaneous session right now, has built this HydroFloods package that allows you to run both in JavaScript and in Python um, to do this flood mapping work. So the first thing is just go ahead and run that first cell, and then you're going to try, you're, this is your first stumbling block. You're going to have to click restart runtime and then click that again. So this is the first stumbling block, but I'll, I'll do it with you all. So in case, in case it wasn't clear before, I've added this graphic in here. So let me do a pip install, and it's going to run this package. Yeah, it takes a few minutes. And we'll go about two cells in, and then we'll go back to the algorithm. So I just want to make sure everyone has it up and running so we can all work together. So it'll say it's successful, and then it's going to give you a, a tornado uh, error. It's just something with uh, the version of GEE map, and we'll just restart that run. Uh, it right there, just crash and go restart run. Say yes, and then you'll run it again, and that's it. It's a nice little workaround that <laughs> we came up with. Let that run. Perfect, and it should run really fast the second time. Okay, and then I'll do this import of uh, uh, Earth Engine, and then this is where I want us to have another kind of stumbling block here. Um, as soon as we get through this next one, we'll get back into the algorithm. Um, so once this installs, you can do this cell right here. You can see that little check mark in case you aren't familiar. That'll let you know that this cell is run. You're all good to go. Uh, it doesn't print anything out, but this is just importing all those packages. And then here's where you kind of want to study the setup. There's seven separate steps about actually setting up your, connecting your Earth Engine account to this Colab to run everything. So I'll just walk through that. You can see in the slides as well. Uh, this is where if you don't have a, a Google Earth Engine uh, project set up, it might be kind of confusing. Um, and we have folks in the room to help with that. So I'm going to do the um, authentication. And this is where for the for the video, uh, hopefully you guys will uh, edit out my key <laughs> so no one's using my account later. So you can see I've got a, a cloud project. This is where if you don't have one, it, it should be blank here. Um, but we just want to generate this token and then continue with my account. And then I'm going to hit continue here, even though it doesn't look like it's the, the blue one here, but I want to say continue. And then I'm selecting that I want to manage my Earth Engine data uh, and add these permissions. And then hit continue here. So do those two check boxes and hit continue. And this is where uh, I can grab that, uh, that code, that token, and then put that back right here. So now this will allow me to run Earth Engine in Colab. And I can pull up that package that is the HydroFloods package to be able to run and do all of my analyses uh, that I, I'd want to. So it kind of allows you to, if you're more comfortable in Python, or if you're just wanting to maybe leave the code editor and try out some things, this is a, a way to use that. And I will just run these last two, letting me know what version of HydroFloods package we have. Uh, perfect. OK, so we have officially moved through all of these steps. If you're, any, if you're confused, anyone was confused through that, it's OK. <laughs> the, the session is capacity building. You're supposed to be learning. Um, Yeah. It's a good sign. Everyone's like, we're on it. <laughs> OK, so we've, we've run through that very first portion of the code. Um, and this is where I just want to do a very fast knowledge check-in. Because we've, all we've done is sort of talk about Severe. And we've talked about setting up the collab. Who is familiar with Sentinel-1? Got some strong hands. This group over here is like, we know what we're doing. We're in the wrong session. <laughs> That's good. Uh, if you don't know Sentinel-1, um, it's one of the um, uh, products that's already in Google Earth Engine. It's a C-band um, 
product that is it's a radar product. Um, and if you're trying to come up with new ways to use Earth observations, you know, a lot of folks start with Landsat and then maybe want to move into SAR as, a, as another tool in their toolbox. Um, there is a resource here that the Severe Science Coordination Office, along with other folks, have developed for practitioners. So people who are working on forestry or working on above ground biomass, using SAR to sort of answer those questions. And it's meant to be a real gentle uh, guide into how to use SAR. So this is a really useful um, tool. Uh, we're not actually going to talk about forestry in this session. It's more about uh, flood mapping, but this is a great resource to just um, get your gears turning and walk away with as well. Um, it was a publication that came out a couple years ago. Okay, so uh, hydro floods itself. Um, this is a, a, a Google Earth Engine package and a Python package, and really it's a, it's a platform if I was to consider it uh, anything. Um, what it actually utilizes is a series of different sensors, so Landsat, MODIS, VIRS, Sentinel-1. It has the ability to use all of these sensors to create flood inundation maps in near real time. And you can run it operationally. We can get, that, get into that in the later slides as well. Um, but it allows you to be able to produce those flood maps for locations where you know, it's generally very, very cloudy. Um, so let me just open up these slides a little bit uh, bigger here while I'm going through them. Um, so it's publicly available. Um, the code base is in these slides. So depending on your workflows, you know, if you're leaving this conference and you're interested in flood inundation, feel free to check out these packages. We have documentation and the code base itself fully on the web. You know, part of the uh, transfer to open science through NASA is making sure these packages are open for folks to use and build upon. Uh, we also have a, a web-based tool, which is later in the slides as well, of how the system is running operationally. Um, and the idea is really to just improve the flood mapping in near real time for partners, so especially like the World Food Pro Program that we partner with. Um, and also, you know, the, this tool is built as a way to uh, connect folks around the disaster cycle. So not only being responsive to floods, but being prepared for incoming floods as well. So there's some precip uh, components that are built into uh, the front end application as well. And then um, if you're wanting to explore this later, there's some use case examples of how this tool has been used. Um, and a lot of this has been in collaboration with Google as well. Um, and this provides, I should just wrap up here, provides the extent, the flood extent um, for locations that you actually have the system running operationally. Um, and it also, we're working right now on the flood severity. So not only you know, where a flood is, but how long that flood has been there. So that's really important for agriculture, especially if fields are flooded for you know, a week versus a day. You know, that'll, that'll make a big difference on food security. Uh, also, the flood depth for you know, evacuation or you know, planning for infrastructure, especially uh, folks who are directly affected. That's another area of research we're still exploring. Um, so the, all this is sort of packaged into that as well. We're only going to talk about just the flood inundation because we only have you know, only a few more minutes left. Um, but this, this is all built into that application. And as I mentioned before, we'll, we'll get right into the code here, but uh, that documentation, the GitHub, is here. You can click on this and go right to the GitHub. And we also have far more documentation on each of the algorithms and the approaches that are used in the package. Um, so you can you know, try out different uh, approaches. Um, and they're all documented in, in great detail here as well. So I'll hand it over to Biplov here on sort of the what is Hydro Floods uh, beyond just the front end. Thanks, team. Uh, yeah, so HydroFlood is a cloud-based platform. Uh, so that means we overcome many of the big data challenges. It's built on top of Google Earth Engine and our operational setting is run using a Google Cloud ecosystem, some of which we'll be uh, discussing later on. So that means it also provides you an end-to-end -end processing system. These are some of the workflows that you can uh, try on the hydrofloods. We have QA masking, the speckle filtering on the SAR, all those good stuff. We also have a separate uh, module on the machine learning workflows where we have also <coughs> used a machine learning framework to detect the surface water from the area of sensors. And currently we're working on uh, fusing different sensor in order to uh, sort of have a combined uh, multi-sensor approach to uh, map the water. So uh, one of the biggest advantages of why HydroFlood is so powerful is that 
it, it can use all these area of sensor that are out there. Uh, so that means it can uh, come back some of these temporal gaps that could arise, especially in case of flooding, there is a uh, very high probability that there's gonna be a cloud cover uh, with the optical sensor. So we make use of the uh, radar or SAR sensors, also make use of several other sensor. Um, there's sort of two workflows. Uh, here today we'll be mostly focusing on the one on the left side where we'll be using the Hydra Floods API uh, and Z API in Python and we'll run that over the Colab notebook. Uh, in our operational setting, we use the Google Cloud uh, framework. So we have uh, this uh, a scheduler running every day or every whenever new uh, data sets come in. So we generate all these products on the fly automatically and then push those results back into the Earth Engine as a uh, Earth Engine asset and then use our client uh, interface, the UI UX, uh, to visualize those uh, products. Uh, so as I mentioned before, we're working on the Fusion product. That's that's a work in progress, but we have workflows ready where we can use a single sensor. Uh, here today, we'll be mostly looking on this uh, upper kind of workflow where we'll be using a thresholding approach on the Sentinel-1 imagery. Uh, we'll be uh, using, so this method is based on a paper by Gena et al, 2016, and I believe Nick has a blog post on the Ezotsu in Medium post. So you can refer to that as well. I'll explain a little bit on how this work in the next slide. And you can also check out our paper, uh, uh, Market at All 2020, where we applied this over uh, in Cambodia. We have a separate workflow on machine learning uh, where we used a fully convolutional uh, neural network to map uh, the surface water. And we actually have, um, carried out like several iterations and uh, several uh, parameter tuning in this uh, workflow. So it's an interesting paper. Yeah, so thresholding uh, algorithm is what we're gonna be using today. Uh, it's, uh, it's called the OTSU thresholding. The idea is that you'll, you'll be creating a histogram. It's an automated approach. So the algorithms would create this histogram and then it will uh, sort of try to find a threshold where you it maximizes the class variance between two classes, in our case, water and non-water. So here you can see the pixel in intensity on the x-axis and the number of pixels on the y-axis. The red line is the interclass variance and the algorithm is trying to find a, sort of a threshold where it can maximize uh, the variation between the two classes. So that's all what is happening on the background uh, when you're using the algorithm. Uh, so I'll just briefly go over a high level o workflow that we'll be doing today. Uh, we'll be uh, getting some of the Sentinel-1 image collection from Google Earth Engine. And Earth Engine already has some of the pre-processing done on the Sentinel-1 imagery. There's additional pre-processing steps that uh, we'll be uh, doing. Uh, especially um, we'll be doing a terrain correction and the speckle uh, filtering over those. We'll be using a gamma map speckle filtering here. And then we'll use some of the digital elevation model data sets uh, to carry out this thresholding to uh, extract the water from the uh, Sentinel-1 imagery. So the Hydra floods, uh, it's, it's, it's a very generic framework. Uh, we developed this method over in the lower Mekong region uh, with our regional office, uh, ASIN Disaster Preparedness Center. Uh, we've done several iterations of the uh, method. Uh, we've been developing this for the last four years uh, and we're at this stage where we are operationalizing this um, in a, so that we can produce a daily water map. Our product has been used by the World Food Program in the Lower Mekong region. And now we're uh, interested in uh, replicating these workflows in other regions. So Central America is our upcoming hub and we've uh, used the hydroflux to, uh, to 
detect surface water that is caused by some of the uh, hurricane event that happened over there. Uh, so in this workflow, we'll be looking at uh, hurricanes ERA and IORA in uh, Central America over uh, Guatemala uh, for the period of 2020 November, and we'll be using HydroFloods uh, Python API to, de to uh, detect these uh, flood uh, water bodies. Okay, so let's move back to the code and I'll hand it over to him to uh, sort of walk us through the stuff. Perfect, all right. So you've got the background of what HydroFloods is and why we do it. I'm glad uh, Biplov talked a little bit about the uh, transfer. You know, we build a lot of services in one location and we want to try them out in other locations because obviously flooding is important. Understanding flooding is important everywhere. So um, now let's just use this use case in Cambodia. So uh, hopefully everyone is right along with me. We're going to um, pull up the, the bounds of, of uh, Guatemala, and then we're going to just pick uh, a start date. So for anyone in the room, you know, feel free to just run through this example with us, but you can use this as a tool going forward. You can just change out your region of interest. You can just search you know, the, the two code, the, the country code that you need um, and apply that elsewhere. And then you can also do it for the, the time period that you're interested in. So we're only just selecting just a known hurricane event where we could visibly see that flooding. So it's, it's a bit of a canned example, but uh, it's for, for good demonstration here. Um, and then we're going to just print out the number of total images for just that time period. So we had a total of four images that came up um, for this, this region. And now we're going to bring in our um, uh, DEM, and that we're going to use this for uh, our uh, corrections. So let's pull this in here. And also, we've linked in some, some of the papers as well. You can find this in the documentation, but we wanted to make them sort of interconnected. So you can go and check out this paper if you want. Um, but we're going to be grabbing that and using the, the Merit DEM for the corrections here. And that's where we actually apply. We use this um, for our Sentinel-1. We're applying that uh, slope function the slope correction here, and that's going to provide us a Sentinel-1 flat. Uh, and that's, that's our terrain corrected uh, image, sets of images. And now, let's see here. This is where we're going to actually start utilizing some of the, the speckle filtering that's built into the, pa the Python package. So I know a lot of folks in here, I kind of, we did a, a raise of hands, who's familiar with Sentinel-1? Some people were like, yes, I'm super familiar. Some people are not so much. Um, the product that's available in Google Earth Engine is the GRD product, uh, which is great for like uh, quick analyses, but there's a lot of correction that could be added to it for like more intensive uh, decision making. So this is where this package could be really helpful because we've built in a lot of different uh, speckle filterings that all with just one, one line of code you can just get off and running. Um, and you can check out all the different ones as well. So let's go ahead and hit run, and we're just adding this uh, gamma speckle filtering. Uh, and that's going to provide us that filtered, terrain-corrected Sentinel-1 image collection of those four images. OK, and now we're just doing a smoothing. So we're basically taking uh, a focal mean of 40, moving a circle over that to just smooth out that image collection. So now we've got you know, a, a terrain-corrected, a gamma uh, speckle filtered, and then a smooth image collection. So we're just sort of melding that uh, um, Sentinel-1 image set as best we can for the next set of purposes. And then we're just running this visualization here. So we give it some parameters to how we want to visualize it uh, later on in the code. And then let's go ahead and put that up on the map here. So we're just using the GEE map integration. And this is just a, a, another Python package that allows you to visualize um, instead of using like Folium, you can use this GE map to do a lot of visualizations. It's a nice, nice package. Go ahead, Emil. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Emil said uh, shout out to Professor Wu at University of Tennessee, who is one of the chief people behind this development of GE map and a lot of contribution from folks here in the room, too. I know a lot of Googlers uh, and uh, Geo for gooders <laughs> are, are part of that. I just made up a term. Um, so we're we're adding this to the map here. We've got uh, our region of interest, and then this final this aggregated collection, and we're mosaicing it together. And this is where our flood map is, or our, our Sentinel One image is. So it's just letting us know, hey, we've got this image. We're putting it up on the map. So now we actually want to do the the edge Atsu approach. So we've got this really nice collection of Sentinel One. Let's feed it into this algorithm to start looking at, 
building those histograms, and then finding that variance, and then classifying water and non-water. So this is where we actually apply that function. It's the edge Atsu. And here, feel free, we're not going to get into the details, but you can check out all of this documentation about where you draw your threshold, what polarization you use, uh, what's the edge buffer on your Sentinel-1, et cetera. And this is really important because you know we've done a lot of calibration for Cambodia, and now we're just trying it in Guatemala. So everyone here probably has their own region of interest, and where you draw that threshold is really kind of a trial and error. And this is one place I would imagine you could come back to and sort of fiddle with as well. So let's go ahead and run that. And it's going to, just within a second, it just did all that classification for us. And we're mosaicing that together. And then right here, um, we are masking out all of the background pixels, essentially. Everything that isn't water, we don't want to visualize anymore. We're just adding a, uh, a function here to just say, give us that binary water image. Um, and it's going to run. And then we're going to map that one more time. So within just a few lines of code, we've taken all those um, images, we've done all the processing, we've run this algorithm, and we've produced this, this map of known flooded locations um, as, as determined by the Sentinel-1. And again, you can use other uh, Earth observations, not just Sentinel-1, uh, and we'll have that fuse product as well. Uh, but that's the idea here, is that in just a few lines, you could have a product that you can make decisions with. So this is where, you know, if, depending on how familiar folks are, I'd assume we made the assumption here that a lot of people are just like JavaScript, uh, Google Earth Engine, uh, uh, code editor folks. Um, so sort of this is where that connection point is, where you can start to export products from this collab back to your Google Earth Engine. So you can use this workflow and kind of send things back and forth if you really wanted to. If you're more familiar with your visualization in Google Earth Engine or some of those other workflows, you can do that as well. So I'll just show how they're interconnected there. Um, and go ahead, Emil. Thank you. And so just to say, again, you know, in the actual slides, they have that graphical workflow of kind of you know, like, why are we doing the OTSO thresholding? Why are we doing the, 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 the filtering? When are we bringing in the DM, et cetera? There's, like, uh -huh, this whole detection workflow. And basically, that's what you're walking through uh, with this notebook, uh, as Tim just said. Yes, thank you, Emil. Thank you. Um, and so here is where we can uh, define our export image. So this is this allows us to go back to Google Earth Engine if we want. Um, because again, we want you guys to have the flexibility if you're more comfortable in that realm. So we'll run that, and it just sets up our export for us. We want to include that system time, because uh, when you do that classification, you lose the information associated with that Sentinel-1 image. So we're pasting that over, we're setting that, so that way your classified image has that information about that time. Because it's really important if you want to do some analysis of pre and post floods, having that time associated with that classification. So this is where I have one more stop here. Um, you can export this if you so choose. The way to do this is you can just go to this line and you can edit this code right here. You can go ahead and change any assets. You can name, essentially what you want to do is you want to add your username right here. So this will allow you to export that image to your assets and have that as an image. If it, Feel free, go ahead and do that right now. Or you can just run mine. <laughs> it'll probably break. But it'll allow you to, you can also just proceed using my shared open asset. So this is searchable. Uh, you can use that later on. It's totally fine to use. This takes about 13 minutes to export back into Google Earth Engine. Even though you've got the image right here, it'll allow you to then like export it, download it, um, use it in uh, QGIS, whatever you want after the fact. So this is the way to export it back. And I'll just run that. and. Um, See, I didn't pray to the demo gods. <laughs> Let's see here. What's the issue? Oh, 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 oh. Test. Classic. <laughs> nice. Okay, so this will be running. And then on, if you feel free to click on this link, and this will take you to Earth Engine again to where we've already exported it. So you can just visualize, if you're, if you're sort of more comfortable here, you can visualize this and just e see this image. So there it is, right there. And one other thing I would recommend is to sort of connect all the dots on how this is running in the background. If you go to your tasks here, this will tell me it is not running. But it'll. this is where your 
uh, job that you've already built in the export will be running as a task. So you can kind of see that even though you're using it in Colab, it's actually running in Google Earth Engine in the background. Um, I've already run mine. It's not going to, I have to, let me just change the name so you can just see. Um, calling it test again. This is classic no-no. <laughs> there we go. I'll run it one more time. So then you can see if I open up the task manager here, um, give it a second to load. It's running. So you can kind of see how they're all interconnected now. Um, so that way, maybe you're not so uh, scared or timid of jumping into Colab because it kind of opens up a lot of um, Python packages that have been built uh, that are a little bit more user friendly for um, scaling things. Um, so this is a good way to sort of transition into that. And also I'll plug, it's a great way to start building skills if you want to start exploring different models like some of the deep learning models and the TensorFlow uh, uh, pathways that Nick had talked about as well. This is a great way to start using Colab to sort of talk about the interconnectedness. Okay, so this is going to take 13 minutes to, to run, uh, but you can use my package or my uh, asset ID to move forward. So here we want to do a pre and post analysis. So we know where flood, floods have uh, appeared for this, this time period. We have those four images. They've been processed, train corrected. We've done some smoothing. We've run an edge Atsu approach. And now we've got some images. They're exporting. We can put them in a map and send them off to some decision makers. But we want to do some more analyses. So we have this, uh, my image asset. So everyone can just use this. You don't have to change it. Or you could comfortably wait the 13 minutes and add in your ID as well. Um, so I'm going to run this, and this is giving me my uh, event. This is my flood event. And then I've got my SAR images and my, my pulling out my selecting my water as the classification there. So now we've got this pre-event. This is for a time in September to October. We've got for Guatemala, we've got this full month of Sentinel-1 images. That, that was before the hurricane. So we want to go ahead and consider that our pre-event. So we're basically just taking locations where we don't expect water, right? And we're going to compare those to locations where we do have water. So that's our pre-event. Now we're going to do the exact same steps again. We're going to flatten it. We're going to do everything we need to. So that way, we're, we're considering apples to apples here. So we're going to flatten that with our slope correction for our non-flooded location. And then we're going to filter it again with that same uh, speckle filtering. And then we're going to do uh, a mean. So we're just going to um, basically take that full, if you were in the reducer section, we're going to take that that full um, collection, we're going to just take a mean of that, um, just flattening it in, a, in the calculation here. So then we've got this pre-water. This is the, that pre-image that we've got. It's basically the mean for um, that terrain corrected, slope filtered, non-flood event. And we're going to pr perform that uh, same edge Atsu. So we're just going to apples to apples here, compare them. And then built into the hydroflood system is this discrete difference. This allows you just within one line of code to just compare them every pixel to pixel if it's flood or not flood, essentially. So there is many, many tools built in uh, functionality that's already within uh, HydroFloods that you can go and explore in the documentation. This is just one example. It's like the simplest example. But you can find for your use case, there's probably a tool already built in here. And if there isn't, that's just a great time to reach out to us, and we'll probably build it for you. <laughs> um, so let's go ahead and run this. It, it does the differencing between your pre-flood and your, uh, your flood event. And then let's visualize that. So let's go ahead and put this on the map here. So we've got our pre-event Sentinel-1. That's going to be our raw imagery. So let's just in interrogate this map a little bit here. All right. So we've got our Sentinel-1 from September to October. Does not look like flood. We've got are pre-event water. So this is locations where we know that there's water, essentially. This is where the edge Atsu says, over that full month, we know that water exists here, and it's able to detect that river, essentially. Now, oops, let's look at our, during the hurricane for that time period, this is what the image is. So let's compare just our Sentinel-1 outputs. So we can see that, you know, obviously, again, I may be a glazed over the Sentinel-1, um, these images, this image right here, these dark locations, because of the active nature of, of radar, it's sending uh, microwave pulses down. And those are actually hitting the water and bouncing away. So they come, when you uh, interpret this image here, those darker locations are often water. It could be flooded fields, it could be, um, you know, streets, things like that. It's, uh, it's this, this dark 
Uh, patch is a great way to interpret that as a flooded location, in case you weren't aware. Um, but um, again, this is my plug to go look at the SAR handbook if you uh, are excited about any of this. So this is the post uh, event. This is where the hurricane is, you know, kind of already moved through, and we can see that there's a lot of flooding that we propose. And this is the hydro floods output. So this is us saying, here is, because of this edge Atsu, here's these flooded events. So let's compare the, oh, let me put on the water here. So known river during the month of September to October, and then that flood event. And then let's look at the differenced image. So that really just gets rid of the river and is only looking at flooded locations. So within just, you know, if you automate this, which we have, you can have a code that provides you just flooded locations on a, uh, like a discrete amount of time. Um, so it's really great for like response. And if you uh, also have folks who have this as an integrated system, it can be great for like uh, rapid decision making. So these, this is the output for, um, go ahead. Emil, yeah, go ahead, Emil. Yeah, and ju just, to, just to add on that, I mean, again, with, with Geo for Good overall event, you know, you're, you're being introduced to different types of tools. You saw the deep learning stuff, as, as Tim said, from, from Nick and folks yesterday. But um, at least I've always found this kind of stuff interesting because you, know, you have two images, right? You've differenced them, and if essentially you've created new data. And again, the example we're using is, is for Guatemala. It was you know, developed by, by some other colleagues that we work with. But again, as, as, as Tim and Biplov were saying, you can quite easily just change the AOI um, of this. You could just put in a different country name if you want. You could put in different dates. And you can run this and test this out for any part of the world you want. And again, and if you have problems you know, uh, running that, et cetera, um, Tim, Biplov, Lauren in our office, and other folks, and you know other folks that we work with are more than happy to follow up with you, you know, after this event, and you know try to get that working. Because again, we're just, you know, it's a really cool set of tools, and we just want people to to dig into it. And as Tim said before as well, there's a lot of documentation in case you feel shy and don't want to reach out to us. Thank you. Yeah, and so let's do like a quick knowledge check, and we've got about 15 minutes left. We could either proceed with our bonus material and walk through some more code. You probably have already seen our, uh, our funny little meme in there. Or we can sort of explore the front end of the operational system of Hydro Floods. So I'll just take a quick poll. I'm looking at everyone's eyes here as you're like actively reading the code and running things. What are you guys more interested in? Um, like sort of the operational use of how Hydro Floods works, or maybe some more examples of some other functionality in the code that allows you to sort of slice this, this uh, apple in a different way to come up with different solutions. So what do you guys think? Is that option one? Go ahead. In anybody. Eli, first. Option one, so looking at the, hi the operational system. OK, and back there. Option one. OK, cool. Yeah, option one. Oh, you guys are raising your hands for one. I got it. <laughs> See, there you go. I'm catching on. OK, so. Um, We'll go back into the operational system. I just wanted to let you guys know that there are some bonuses in here. So feel free to check out the bonuses that are, are, are hidden in here as well. They go through an example of looking at permanent water. So looking at the full JRC uh, data products of like 30 years of Landsat where we know there's water and using that as a way to get rid of known water locations. You can also slice that another direction looking at the, se the, the occurrence of that. You can also look at the seasonally influenced locations. So putting that all together in this final code block here, you can look at all the dynamics of a 30 years worth of JRC water and then using that to difference and pull out relevant information for hydro flood. So that's your bonus. Feel free to walk away with that. That's your first goodie. OK, so let's go back to the slides here and talk about the operational use. Tim, um, can I also just yeah, go do ahead. a quick poll of the audience? Just, just also wondering, I mean, how many people in here are you know, familiar, have used uh, Colab before in, with Earth Engine? I'd say about a little over half. Awesome. Just good to know. Thank you. Yeah. So um, as sort of like a, uh, a way to condense everything, um, I know you guys are inundated with a lot of slides and a lot of content for uh, Geo for Good, and that's a good thing. Uh, so we wanted to make a one-stop shop. This has like links to the HydroFlood system, links to the documentation, the open uh, uh, source code, the web portals, uh, some of the capacity building material. All that stuff is just in this slide. Feel free to link, click on any of these links, and it'll take you there. So uh, that's th the first place we go. And then this is where I wanted to talk about the operational workflow. So this is option one. Um, so we've built the system to to run, and we just have um, 
the example just working on Sentinel-1, but again, you can use this for Sentinel-2, Landsat-8, Landsat-9, you know, whatever. It's just running in the background. So this is where we have this daily cron that says, if there's imagery for anywhere in Cambodia for this example, or Southeast Asia, we want to grab that and we want to do all the processing, pre-processing we want, and then pick the algorithm that we want, because we only talked about the edge Atsu, but there's many, many other algorithms in this package to produce that flood inundation, and then also derive flood depth, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it puts us all on this front end right here. So as you can see, we've got this daily cron. It's grabbing those then processed images. It's, it's doing that calculation of how long that pixel has been inundated. It's looking at that, uh, the duration, and then it's, it's pushing that back, and even doing the calculations of the JRC, as I mentioned before. It's looking at that 30 years worth of data and pulling out the locations where it's known as flood. And then that is that final merged water classification, and then the date of that uh, classification. So let's just go to this right here. This is the front end for the hydrofluid system in um, Severe Mekong. So we've talked a little bit about the background of that code. Um, let's go ahead and open this up. And very quickly, this is, a, this is probably where you want to explore a little bit. Um, I just skipped a slide, and I'll go back to that with a, the few minutes I have here. But you can select a date. Uh, this date, we, just for our canned de demo here, you can pick the, the 27th and zoom into a location uh, north of or northwest of Tonle Sap. Um, and see some of the flooding. So I'll switch to that right now. So I'm going to pick the operational. Uh, this is the, the system that's running all the time. I'm going to take all of my merged sensors. So I'm going to take SAR and optical, grabbing those together. That happens all in the background. And then I want to select a date. So let's do the 27th. And then let's go ahead and update these flood layers. Give it a minute here. Uh oh. <laughs> Let's pick a different date. September twenty sixth. What is it on August fifth? Do I not have it displayed? Well, let me switch to. Oh, there we go. Okay, I just have to wait. <laughs> it's hard for me. All right, so you can see here these, these are locations where it's, it's predicting, uh, it's detecting the, the flooded water, both for SAR, optical, and merged. It's also giving the seasonal output, so it's looking at the JRC for certain times, and it's looking at that permanent water, so the long term where we know there's you know, lakes, there's rivers, there's reservoirs, things like that, and it's removing those to not be confused with inundated locations. And then you can click on these individual districts, and it actually gives you these outputs of you know, the demographics for those districts, and that's really important for you know, the, the uh, Cambodian government and also the World Food Program, who we partner with on, on using some of these. Go ahead, Neil. No, I guess I, I was just going to ask a question. Um, so, but basically, if folks in here were interested in doing something similar for their respective, you know, geographies, basically, this is pulling from that same Colab notebook, correct? Is yeah. There, and also, is there an option to then turn on the optical, op the optical part of the notebook? Yeah, so for the optical, like if you wanted to switch gears and start looking at optical, you would just, instead of using the Sentinel-1, you could just use Landsat. And then that apply function that you'd be using, you would just use the uh, corresponding um, algorithm for Landsat. And that's all in the documentation as well. So the one thing I would say here is, you know, with depending on where you're doing your analyses, Sentinel-1 is probably a great place to start because it's probably cloudy. <laughs> and that's probably, you know, if it's a hurricane, you know, there's going to be clouds, right? So Sentinel-1 is a great place to start. But if you want to run this operationally, you can use any of these um, Earth observations in your solution for flood mapping. And for instance, yeah. you know, our, our colleagues from uh, NGA over there who I, who I know are also um, doing work supporting disasters, I guess another one is, uh, our other colleagues, Kel and Lauren, actually have, a, have different versions of the same notebook that already have the merged optical and SAR, correct? Yeah. Uh, also to add to that, so if you're using optical imagery, it, it might be a good idea. You can use, for example, some of the indices, like the normalized different water indices, so that would probably give you a single indices that can capture the water more accurately than using a raw you know, red, green band or other kind of uh, bands. Perfect, yeah, so just exploring this front end, you can see there's 
many different layers mixed in here as well. I won't go into all of these. This is kind of like your parting gift with our only few minutes left here of something to explore. So you've sort of looked at the code. You've hopefully kind of understood the, the background of how to get from point A to point B. And this is what's served up to decision makers here. So you can kind of see the demographic information that's also connected to that. And I just want to take one kind of plug here to talk about um, our collaboration with the World Food Program. Um, so these locations, you can see here in uh, October 24th, uh, in 2020, there was obviously, uh, Cambodia is a very flood prone country, and you can see there's uh, massive flooding that had occurred uh, throughout a good portion of Cambodia. And through this system, through this collaboration, this allowed for the World Food Program to generate these reports and start mobilizing some response. So that integration, um, kind of connecting this all the way back to co development at the very beginning, what Emil talked about, is these aren't just solutions, just for the sake of solutions. The idea is that we've been collaborating over the past four years with partners at ADPC, um, who are the, the hub implementers, and also with folks here at Google, and also the World Food Program, to make a product that someone could actually use and um, help with response or help with preparedness, for instance. So um, if you're interested in any of this, feel free to explore it. Feel free to reach out to us, um, because the idea is that this framework can work anywhere in the world. Okay, so let's, as any good uh, scientist would say, let's talk about what doesn't work. <laughs> because it's, all, it's not all just uh, uh, hunky-dory, right? Um, so the pros here is that, you know, it provides these daily wall-to-wall -wall maps at 10 meter resolution if you're using Sentinel-1, uh, which allows you to estimate that surface water. It's great, it's what we talked about. Um, it allows you to also, you know, support uh, this semi-daily or near real-time uh, reporting for, you know, surface water, which is great. Some of the cons here is, because there is that lag, that inherent lag of you know, Sentinel-1 getting into Google Earth Engine to then be processed and then you know, waiting for that Earth observation, it's not great about real time. It's more near real time. So it's not gonna capture things like dam breaks or like immediate flash flooding. Um, it can catch like large scale flooding uh, that occurs over a couple of days, but you know, like depending on your hydrologic regime, you, know, you may miss out on some of those use cases. So just be thinking about that. Um, and consulting as you're sort of going through the methodologies here. And then the last thing here is, you know, the accuracy of some of these maps, you know, we should be clear, you know, they're not truth, right? Uh, George E.E. E. Box said, um, all models are wrong, some are useful, and this is just another model, right? So we just want to make that clarity here that we're doing a lot of pre-processing on the Sentinel-1, um, and that allows us to come up with a product that we're really confident in, but again, there are um, some correction issues where pixels are shifting and things like that, so you just have to be aware of that and build that into your um, conversations with your partners as well, you know, if you're going to be using this. Um, okay, so we have just six minutes left. I'm holding you guys up to lunch here. Uh, there's one thing that I want you to do right now is to do our post survey. So again, we want to take all of your, your thoughts. If you grew any skills here, and you know we'll we'll talk about that when we go back to our office. But again, this is supposed to be over like a full day. So honest opinions are great, but like also the idea is you know you maybe got a taste of how we do some of the capacity building. Just imagine this was over like eight hours and not one hour. Go ahead, Emil. Are you going to give the plug for the TensorFlow work working group, which you just yeah? Yeah. So while you guys are clicking on this link, feel free to. Um, you know, fill out your survey, and then I wanted to go back while you guys are doing that, and just make a plug here while at geo for good uh, to talk about another uh, capacity building area that we focus on. Um, so not only are we just building these geospatial tools and collaborating with end users on, you know, those different thematic areas that Emil had talked about at the very beginning, we're also just talking about new cutting edge science, and through a lot of collaboration from Google, from Nick in particular, uh, we've, we've been collaborating on this, um, this TensorFlow working group as a space to start exploring deep learning. So um, we didn't have a lot of time um, to talk about all the other services, but hopefully you'll have this link and you can come check out our website um, if you're interested in um, maybe the, the, the Fuse product that is also a source of some of the deep learning that we're exploring. Um, so that's another area that's not really tied to the thematic areas. Um, it's more cross-cutting about just capacity building, but um, we may have some interested folks in the audience. Okay, so uh, with that, I just want to start wrapping up and say, please fill out that survey. Um, I want to just say a big thanks to um, all the folks from 
um, Southeast Asia in, in Mekong who have developed this tool. Uh, we've, we've been fortunate enough to come and present on their behalf. Um, there's been about four years worth of development, uh, a lot of funding from NASA to, to build this application, so we would be nowhere without those folks. Uh, so I want to provide a big thank you to them and especially to Google and, and ongoing collaboration on that. Um, so if you have any questions, feel, re feel free to reach out to me. Go over to Emil. No, I was just going to also say yes, definite shout out to Google for all the support over the years in, in developing this and as Tim said, ADPC. And also shout out to our colleagues from the Science Coordination Office like um, Kel, no longer with the Science Coordination Office, who you know built the backbone of this. Lauren, who's online, who also you know modified this for, for Central America. Um, also see uh, Betsy, Eric, Aparna, Jacob, Katie, who also joined us remotely. So thank you so much. Yeah, thanks so much. And Bipoff, do you have any, any sign-offs? No. Uh, yeah, I just want to plug in the TensorFlow Working Group. We have some great content in the Working Group. Uh, we try to bring on people who have been using machine learning for some of the cross-cutting uh, you know, technology and applications. There are also several videos online that you can go back and watch. And if you're interested, just, uh, just go and click the link that Tim provided earlier. And that's all. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.